Okay, uh, welcome to today's talk about from one billion years to one second. I chose this as a starting image because it's the timeline of the universe. I don't know you, but I'm not really used to think on time scales of one billion years. So here you can see how different billion years look. So for example, the Earth on the solar system was created four and a half billion years ago. And today I'm going to present some Python algorithm that would take about this long and how you could apply some optimization techniques to actually make it faster than one second. Which is this algorithm? This algorithm is very simple. It takes integers and input, and it produces an output which is also an integer. So the restrictions for the input is that it must not be bigger than one million, and the restrictions for the output is that it must fulfill this equation. x squared plus y squared equals z squared. With the initial restrictions that x, y, and z must be positive integers, x, y, and z must not be bigger than n, and also x, y, and z are relative primed. This means that there is no common divisor for the three of them. Uh, also, another thing is that I'm not just going to read the pre-calculated results from a file and printing it. This is not the sort of optimization I'm going to show today. And uh, let's move on. This is a bit how the problem solutions would look like. So the n would be the input and r the output. So we can see that for the first uh, four results, the, for, for the first one, two, three, four n's, the result is zero because there is no triplet x, y, and z that fulfills all the restrictions we, we saw. Uh, then we see that from 5 to 12, the result is 1 because there's only this uh, triplet that fulfills the conditions, and 14 and so, and so on, then it's 2. Here we can already see some pattern. There are four zeros, eight ones, four twos, eight threes, four fours, eight fives, and so on. But this pattern stops being true after 48. So that's not the easy solution to get it down to one second. To start with, uh, you may wonder how did I estimate this to be one billion years, because of course, I didn't run it for one billion years and time it. So what I did is uh, I run all the code in this 2012 laptop. The specs are available on the GitHub repo as well. And I took the best time of, the, uh, of five runs for each algorithm and input. And I took the best time because all the other times are probably overhead. And to calculate the time, I first calculated the algorithmic complexity of each uh, different uh, combination of input and algorithm. And uh, with this, here we have an example. So if n equals 100 takes one minute, n equals 200 takes eight minutes, and n equals 400 takes 64 minutes, here we could say that the algorithmic time complexity is uh, cubical because every time we are making the input size double, the time it gets multiplied by 8, and this is 2 to the power of 3. So using the same function, we could infer that for n equals 400,000, the time would be 130,000 years, and this is how I did it. Okay, are you good at estimating speedups? Here, if you want to play a little game, you can type this URL and you will have some form you can fill in. And uh, you can try to calculate uh, how, fi how fast the new speedup will be compared to the previous one. You can also use a paper if uh, that's more convenient for you. And how we will calculate this? So we will take the current time divided by the previous time. So for example, if the new code takes half the time as the previous one, this would be a 2x speedup, because 1 divided by 1 half is 2. If the new code would take 75% the time of the previous one, it will be 1.33x using the same equation. So this is the baseline. This is the initial naive solution I, I tried. It took 100,000 years, or it would take 100,000 years for n equals 1 million. And if we wanted to calculate 100,000 random n's, this would be more than one billion years. So here we have a reminder of our restrictions, and this is what we calculate here. We take x, y, and z, and we go from 0 to n. Then we calculate that they are co-prime using the greatest common divisor function. Then we check that they fulfill the equation x squared, y squared, equals z squared. And finally, here, we also check that x is as more than y and is as more than z. Uh, I added this restriction because we want the combinations to be unique. Otherwise, we could change x and y, 
and they would solve all the other restrictions, but not this one. Uh, when all this is true, then we add one to the number of combinations. And here I'm just using an integer to store the result because we are not interested in the specific results. We are only interested in the number of combinations. Before we know if this is fast enough, we need to see how we calculate the GCD. And here I'm using a very simple version, which is the Euclid algorithm. But even if it's simple, I think it's quite used nowadays. The first version uses an auxiliary variable, the second doesn't, but they are basically the same. So first optimization, don't reinvent the wheel. If people from Python have implemented GCD in the math library, it's probably a good idea to use it, not only for performance reasons, but it's probably better tested and more used than one you can implement yourself. Here you can see the speed up. I'm comparing v0 with itself, and of course the speed up is one. But how faster will it be if I use the math GCD instead of the version I implemented? Well, 1.61, that's good. The next optimization is uh, called uh, peep hole optimization, and it's very similar to strength reduction. So this consists on taking a function that's very generic and using a more specific one that does the same job for the specific problem we have in mind. And uh, of course, this newer function will be faster, otherwise, why would we change it? In our case, we will change the exponentiation by multiplication. Here we can see the commented lines. This is the bytecode that CPython interpreter uses. We will see more on that later. And on the first version, we were using binary power. And on the second version, uh, this uses binary multiply, which is faster. How faster? 2.19 times. Good. The next optimization is short circuit evaluation. So from a logical point of view, when we have uh, if comparison with many clauses, the order doesn't matter. We are only interested in the result. But uh, computers tend to execute code sequentially. That is, a computer is not executing all the clauses at once. And then the order matters. If we have an if condition that's a chain of n clauses, if the first one is false, we don't need to evaluate the other ones because the end result will be false. And how did we exploit this characteristic in our code? Well, we took the GCD function, which is quite expensive, and we moved it the last one. And then we took the x is more than y is more than z, which is a very uh, cheap to calculate function, and we put it the first one. Another good approach would be to try to put as the first function or the first clause one that's very likely to fail, because then we will save calculating the other ones. But uh, this is a bit tricky, and I will insist on this. Uh, we should measure the time and not just rely on our intuitions, because modern computers can execute functions and operations out of order. And this means that if changing this, we change how likely the CPU is to predict the correct result, this will affect the end timing, and it will affect it significantly. So how fast is this? 2.58, good, we're in the right direction. Um, uh, the next optimization is what I just call uh, space reduction. And uh, if we know that some condition beforehand is not going to fulfill our restrictions, why do we want to test it once and again? So in this case, uh, what we did here is, instead of going from 0 to n for x, y, and z, we know that x must be smaller than y and smaller than z. So for y, we can go from x to n, and from z, we can go from y to n. And this way, we save many iterations. As a side effect, since this restriction is now embedded in the for loops, we don't need to compare it every time again. So that's an uh, extra good thing in terms of the speed up we can achieve, which in this case is 3.5. Nice. The next optimization is called coit hoisting, and it's a bit similar. So every time we're calculating something in a loop, if the result will not change because the variables doesn't change, we don't need to calculate it once and again in a loop. We can move it outside, calculate it once, and reuse the result. And this is what we did here. Instead of calculating x multiplied by x and y multiplied by y, we moved it outside the loop and calculated once and just add the two variables. And how fast is this going to be? 1.83. Good. Uh, this function is maybe not translatable as well for other languages, but it works here. And uh, as you know, or you may know, when uh, we are calling a function, 
on the on behind the scenes, more things are happening. So the context must be stored, usually in a stack, and uh, so on. And then when the function returns, uh, it restores the context uh, that was out of the scope in the function. But this is also out of the scope of the talk, so I'm not going to go into details. So here, basically, instead of calling everything from main, we put it in a function. But what I was talking about is that this would make code slower. But actually, if we look at the disassembled C Python code, which is not guaranteed to be the same for newer versions of Python, but this has been at least true since Python 2.7, we can see that uh, some of the loading variables, when they are executed in the main code, it uses a store name and load name bytecode operations, and they become store fast and load fast when they are in a function. So will this uh, be faster than the overhead of calling the function? Yes, it is, and it makes the code twice as fast. Next optimization follows the same philosophy as before, that if we know that some code is not going to be useful, then we don't need to execute it. And here we're going to specialize these loops. So we're going to split the first loop into two loops, and we can do this because of a special property of our problem. We have three different numbers in the triplet, and each of them must be coprimes. So this means that at most one of them can be even. If two or more were even, they would be both divisible by two and then they would not be coprimes. So here we created two different loops with a specific uh, arrangement of even and not even numbers as we desire. And then instead of increasing them one every time, we increase them by two. By doing this, we're saving quite a few iterations. How many? 25% of the iterations. This is why the speed up 4.15 is very close to the theoretical speed up of four, but it's... Uh, the number of iterations we saved. And nobody expects compilers in Python. Well, maybe you should. PyPy is a just-in-time compiler, and it's very convenient because, uh, as uh, all compilers do, they translate uh, source code to a different code, maybe, for example, in this case, from Python to CPython that will be interpreted. And while doing so, these programs have the chance to analyze all the code and apply some optimizations themselves. So we don't need to manually type them, because the optimizers do them for you. This is quite convenient, because we can just replace Python by PyPy when running a problem, and it will most likely work out of the box. And yes, I know there are also other Python-based solutions, like Gnome by Python, but uh, this presentation is already quite packed as it is, so we will not talk about them. But uh, just uh, I wanted to mention very briefly C++, because it's a language that's closer to the hardware, and the target language assembly, it's even closer to the hardware. And because of this, the compiler has more possibilities to perform some optimizations, and this may show in having a faster end result than Python. But this depends, of course, on the specific code and machine. We may see this later if we have time. So this is how our times look like. So far, we have a 500x speed up with Python 3. But if we run this until with PyPy, the speed up would be much bigger, almost 100 times. This is, for example, as we can see in the first column, because PyPy, just running the first exact same code with PyPy instead of Python, we are already getting a 10x speed up. And uh, this is why the overall speed up is, is faster. Here we can see uh, how each version was faster compared to the previous one. We see a very big spike with PyPy. So when we were making the short circuit, changing the order of the if clauses, PyPy got a 100x speed up, while Python only got a 2.5. This is because by doing this small change, it was quite significant from the compiler point of view. So the compiler could apply some optimizations that couldn't before. But using compilers is an all uh, advantages because, for example, here we saw on optimization number two, pip hole, or when we did the function inlining, there is no actual speed up using PyPy. This is because PyPy was already doing these or very similar optimizations behind the scenes. So this additional optimization we handcrafted, it was no gain because PyPy was already doing it. Moving on with the code, uh, this optimization I'm uh, presenting now is what I will call paradigm shift or basically full rewrite. This could be important because uh, doing incremental speedups, one can get stuck to local optimas, and uh, this uh, leaves opportunity out of other optimizations that would be much faster. 
So people tend to get emotionally, emotionally attached to the code, and uh, this is something that we need to fight if we want to find these breakthroughs. Uh, this function I, I, I display here is some function that Euclid uh, discovered to produce uh, primitive Pythagorean primes. And uh, you can try it yourself, or trust me, this gives a good result, even though the code looks uh, much different. And is it just different, or is it faster? Whoa, it's nine, times, nine billion times faster, so I think the full rewrite here was worth it. Now, instead of taking hundreds of years, it takes just 1.1 second. And the next optimization we are going to do is uh, early loop termination. So again, we don't want to compute something that we know that's going to be false. And if we can exit the loop earlier, this will save some costly iterations. How costly? Well, uh, this is a part of the function that Euclid discovered. And uh, we see that x multiplied by x plus y multiplied by y must be not bigger than n. So this means that square of n is an upper bound because for y and for x, because uh, a square root of n and a square root of n, if they were y's, they will be already bigger. Uh, also here, you may know that instead of measuring the time it takes to calculate n equals 1 million, now we're taking the time it, calculate, it, it takes to calculate 100,000 random n's. And this is because uh, if we want to optimize uh, less than one second, there will be a lot of overheads. And if we have a bigger problem, these overheads will not take as a proportional time as big as the calculation. And uh, how fast is this? Well, this is 14x. That's a good speed up. Uh, the next optimizations are quite similar to what I've shown. And the speed up is not very big. So I'm going to skip them because we are running out of time, I think. And uh, we jump to another interlude, in this case, profiling. So what's a profiler? A profiler is a program that uh, is running while you're running some code, and it measures uh, how long every part of the code it takes. Here I'm using pprofile instead of the standard Python profiler, because pprofile lets you analyze line by line. And the standard profiler from Python, you can only analyze uh, functions. It's also quite convenient. It's in pip, and it's very easy to use. You just use here a context manager, and then in the end, print the stats. And uh, with this slide, I also wanted to introduce Amdahl's law, or actually a paraphrased version of it, because Amdahl was talking about parallelization, not optimization. And uh, he basically said that the non-optimized part sets the upper bound on the speed up. So if I want to optimize some code that takes one third of the time, I know that the speed up will never be faster than 1.5x, because the rest of the code will still be need to be executed, and it will still be as fast or as slow. So how do we use the profiler? Here is a simplified version of the output. We can see the different lines, how many times they were executed. And uh, here we see that the GCD is the line that took most of the time. Uh, the output we see here is the output of a deterministic profiler. There are also statistical profilers, which are not exact. But uh, the advantage of them is that they take less overhead, so one can use them in production. Here we can see that the file duration it was 2.7 seconds. But this algorithm without the profiler, it, it took just 0 .0, 0 0.06 seconds. So this means that adding the profiler made the code 50 times slower. Usually, you don't want to have code 50 times as slower in production. So uh, know that when using profilers. So having seen which was the line that took most time to execute, now we're going to optimize it. We're going to use memoization, yes, without an R. And uh, this technique consists of taking uh, computations that are very expensive to calculate and uh, store them in a cache. Then next time that we want to calculate the same operation with the same parameters, instead of doing the whole calculation again, we can just retrieve it from the cache. And if the computation is expensive, this will be a very big gain. So in our case, uh, I used LRU cache from Fung Tools because it's very convenient. And here you can see with just one line, I can implement the memo memoization. And how fast is this? Oh. Actually, it is lower. So this could mean that maybe the function I wanted to optimize was not that slow. 
or maybe the size of the cache is very big, so it actually has to retrieve it from main memory, making this even a slower process. But uh, this is very good to see here. So one must measure the optimizations, not just rely on intuition, because this one is a slower, so this one we will not use in our code. I still, uh, I still think reusing results is a good thing, so we will try to base our next optimization on this. And uh, we know that the upper bound of n is 1 million. So I say, why don't we calculate uh, all the results for n from 0 to 1 million? And then when we get the input, we just spin it out. And you may say, this sounds like a good idea, but we are just getting 100,000 random n's. How, calcula how can calculating 1 million n's be faster than just calculating 100 n's? Well, if you are a bit tricky about it, uh, we will not be calculating one million different uh, ends. We will just do it at once. So instead of storing the results in a variable combinations, we will store them in a dictionary. And uh, in the dictionary, the key, the index key, will correspond to the specific n we're going to iterate from zero to uh, max n. And in that specific key, we're going to store the amount of new combinations that were possible because of this key. When all this is computed, then we are going to sum the results to get the final result. For example, uh, for calculating the result of n equals 100, in n equals 100, we will have the amount of combinations that n equals 100, 500 uh, enabled. And then we will also add all the previous ones from n equals 0 to n equals 499. But we will not be doing 500 add operations, we will just be doing one. Because for, for 199, we would have done the same thing from 0 to 498, and so on. I hope this is clear, because now I ask you to estimate how fast this is going to be. And uh, it's going to be 4,000 times as fast. You may think that this is very fast, and there is a good explanation for this. This is because now the algorithmic cost is constant. So it doesn't matter if we want to calculate 100 ends or 1,000 ends. The amount of computations is always going to be the same, because we are always calculating 1 million. So this means that the thing that increases, uh, that makes increased time with input, it's only the reading and writing the lines and converting the strings to integers and so on. And as we said before, memory lo locality is good. So using less memory usually makes the code faster. And this is what we're trying to do here. So uh, there was a property that it might have been uh, a bit concealed, but the values only changed every 4n plus 1. So using this property cleverly, we can just use 25% of the memory we used before, just storing the values uh, as they change using this 4n plus 1 formula. And uh, how fast is going to be saving 75% of the memory? Well, it's going to be 1.77 times. That's very good. And uh, this is quite good because now the overall time is less than one second. This is our goal. This is how the code looks like, removing spaces so it could fit all in one slide. And uh, you may agree with me, I think, that uh, this came with a cost. Not only the developing development time, which is obvious, but I think that now this code is a bit harder to read, maybe, or harder to maintain. Well, uh, this is something one must keep in mind when doing optimizations. Here I wanted to show the lapse times. So the final timings for Python would be 0 0.6. For PyPy, it would be 0 0.5. This is quite close to Python, because actually there is an increased uh, fixed amount of time for PyPy to start. And uh, with C++ using a Clang compiler with this dash O3 flag, which is a quite aggressive optimization flag, it takes 0.05 seconds. So I showed you this because now I can go through the incremental slide, and I think it will be better understood. Here we see something very interesting. PyPy and Python, they become very fast compressed to, compared to the previous optimization when we use the reuse code and we make the algorithmic cost constant. But this is not so for C++. Why is this? Well, if we zoom in a little bit, we can see that when we did memoization, 
we remember that it was slower for PyPy and Python. But for C, since it was closer to hardware, the compiler could perform some optimizations and actually get a 40x speed up. That's very good. If we focus on the last optimization we do, reducing the amount of memory, here I did a port uh, using C++ to be as close as possible as the Python version. So instead of using arrays, which is what I did on version 13, here I used maps or unordered maps. The thing is that because these are closer to Python dictionaries. Uh, the problem with this is that this is a higher level of abstraction, and this makes it the compiler make it harder to perform these optimizations. Why did I want to talk with C here? Well, I wanted to talk about uh, sorry C++, because uh, what works in one language doesn't necessarily work in other language. And of course, instead of just relying on intuition, measuring, we can actually know that this is the case. This slide here, I present the time versus uh, size for Python 3. We have a logarithmic scales in both axes, so this is noteworthy. And I show this slide because when we're dealing with very big inputs, the algorithmic complexity is very important. So we can see that uh, for the first eight algorithms, they were cubic complexity, and this is why the slope is almost flat. For the red ones, the complexity was linear. This means that doubling the input actually doubled the execution time. And uh, for the other ones, it, w it was constant up until tens of thousands of, of input. So here we can see with a vertical line. This is the last plot I'm going to show. And uh, I wanted to add also C++ without using optimization flags. Because this way we can see that PyPy is actually quite good even compared to C++. So for, for some optimizations, PyPy was faster than C++ uh, without the aggressive optimization flag. Here we can also see that for these problems, PyPy was always faster than uh, Python. And C++ was also always faster than PyPy when using this flag. How fast? Well, from uh, 1.25 to hundreds of times. I wanted to show this because, yeah, PyPy can be very good on C++ as well. You can get hundreds of eggs of the speed up, but this is very variable. So maybe you go all the effort of porting the code, and you actually get a speed up that's not very good. This is something one must consider when porting code, if there is another optimization that would be uh, more suitable. So moving through. Yeah, here I had some slide with additional optimizations for the fastest uh, path that could be done with C++ that cannot be done uh, by Python, but if you want to look this, you will have to talk to me later or go to the GitHub repo. And I want to dwell with, end with typical pitfalls, like pitfall Harvey you see here. So the first one is not considering Amdahl's law. If you have a very good speed up plan for a part of the code that takes n square and you move it to n, if the total time is 1%, the speed up will be not very good. Optimizing code is still in development. Maybe when you would finish the development, the code would be faster than uh, your requirements, so you shouldn't spend time on this. Also, optimizing makes the code harder to understand, so this will slow down the development. Not measuring time uh, properly, so we should measure time more than once. If we just measure once, it could be an outlier and not representing the real time. Not checking rec result correctness. So having fast code is very good, but fa having fast code with the wrong result it's not very useful. So we should have exhaustive uh, tests because maybe ma making the code faster, it would change some corner case that's hard to notice. Including more than one optimization at once. Maybe if we include many optimizations at once, the overall time will be faster, but some of them would make the code slower and we won't notice. Ignoring usage constraints, this one is quite important. If we're running the code in a machine that has different specs and different load than the one in production, it may very well be that the optimizations we get don't translate to the real one. And finally, not knowing when to stop. So if we're running, for example, a batch code, uh, does it matter if it takes one second or one minute if it's going to run all the night? Well, maybe not. And related to knowing when to stop, I think it's time to stop uh, this presentation. So I want to thank, here I couldn't list everybody, so I want to thank people from PyCon, the audience, me of course, for coming up with this. Uh, my friend and colleague Matthias, because he revised the 
uh, slide and uh, help me with the C++ uh, conversions as well. And he's working with me at IFBAR and uh, healthcare analytics company we're hiring. We can talk about this later. And lastly, uh, my friend David Garcia, because when we were classmates, he was always teasing me who could write the fastest code. And I think that this was an inspiration for this talk. Thank you very much.